Greetings uh, from <coughs> Amersham, UK. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you to the series of CT angio, uh, angiography seminars. The first seminar is Improving My Daily CT Angiography, and it is about the basics of uh, CT angio. Our speaker today is Professor Christian Lower. He is the head of Department of Cardiovascular and Interventional Radiology at the Medical University of Vienna. He also chairs the Educational Committee of European Society of Cardiac Radiology. He is well published and a member of Editorial Committee of European Radiology. Now, without any further delay, I will hand over to Professor Lower for his presentation. Over to you, sir. Hello and good morning. Uh, thank you very much. Um, it's really a pleasure for me to be here. Um, today, the webinar is entitled How to Improve My Daily uh, CT and Geography. It's the first uh, part um, of a row of uh, a story in uh, three chapters. Chapter one is it's all about contrast. Chapter two uh, will be less is more. And uh, chapter three will be what becomes possible going into clinical practice. Today, again, it's uh, chapter one uh, dedicated to, uh, to the contrast enhancement. But a little bit just to give you an overview about our roadmap uh, about the basics in uh, CT and geography. The content for this chapter today will be the basics about contrast enhancement, administration and scan protocols, followed by chapter two, which will be in autumn, uh, going more into depth, how to achieve more with less, that meaning with less radiation, less contrast, less artifacts. And finally, um, uh, it will be, I guess, before Christmas, uh, chapter three, going into clinical practice, the clinical examples, clinical protocols and clinical challenges for different anatomical fields. But let's start with the really very basics, with chapter one, it's all about contrast, uh, which is the topic uh, for uh, the module of today. My teaching points uh, of this uh, module uh, will be uh, the following, basics about contrast enhancement in CT and geography, how to achieve the optimal contrast, and the basic principles about uh, acquisition uh, at CT and geography. When we are uh, looking uh, for the basics about contrast enhancement in CT and geography, I, there are many questions that we might uh, be confronted with in the daily routine, and I will try my best to answer uh, those questions during my presentation today. One really important question is why is good contrast of such an importance for CTA? What does the good contrast really mean uh, in, uh, in practice? How we can achieve such a good contrast? And what is the relationship between the contrast and the iodine content? Let's start um, about the importance, uh, why uh, the good contrast uh, is that much importance for CTA, uh, really the main, the main question. And uh, when we're looking for contrast enhanced uh, CT scans in general, the importance of contrast is not the same for all the examinations. So the importance of the contrast enhancement depends on what we would like to see and depends on the, on the type of the examinations that we are performing. The contrast is of utmost importance for CT and geography. It's of less importance for body CT. And of course, if you are doing a uh, CT scan of the brain, the contrast uh, administration is of really last importance. You know, you can use a very standardized bolus with a very slow flow if you just look for a um, um, contrast enhanced CT scan. So that means, that means uh, that the importance of the different parameters of um, uh, my contrast injection protocol is depending on the, on the type of the examination that I'm uh, performing. When I'm doing a CT angiography of the aorta, for example, the, uh, the contrast mainly depends on the, on the iodine flux. So that means how much iodine is given to the patient per time. So that's the most relevant uh, parameter for my image quality during a CT and geography. If I'm more interested in uh, seeing the liver parenchyma and if I just would like to enhance uh, the liver parenchyma, my contrast mainly depends on the total vol volume of iodine uh, I give to the patient. So just again, in the, for a body CT, uh, the total contrast volume is the most relevant uh, issue for CT and geography, the flux. Again, 
uh, the content or the amount of iodine given per time to the patient is the major factor uh, determining the image quality. However, in the clinical reality, in many, many situations and in many, many clinical scenarios, we would like to have a combination of both information. So, for example, if you have a patient after liver biopsy uh, suffering from uh, some bleeding complications, what I would like to see is, of course, the arterial, uh, the arterial uh, uh, system and the bleeding to identify the bleeding site. But, of course, I'm also interested uh, to see uh, the, uh, the hematoma within the liver parenchyma. So in many clinical scenarios, we would like not only to have our uh, arterial enhancement, but also the parenchymal enhancement. This is important for setting up our uh, contrast protocol for CT and geography, and I will focus on that a little bit later on. What defines a good contrast? Obviously, contrast is really important for CT and geography. And uh, that's, uh, there is a reason behind. Uh, when we are looking for a typical CT angiographic image, our images mainly based on the contrast differences between the hopefully maximally enhanced arterial uh, system and the non-enhanced surrounding tissue. So the contrast between arterial system and surrounding tissue is of utmost importance. And there is a very straightforward relationship between uh, the iodine uh, content given to the patient and the contrast. As higher the concentration of the iodine in the region of interest during scanning uh, is, as higher the contrast uh, within my images will be. So we need, since uh, contrast is that important, of course we need a good contrast enhancement to end up with good diagnostic image quality. But as you might know from your clinical routine, that's not always so easy uh, to achieve, and there are some things that we have uh, to keep in mind when we are starting our CT and geographic protocol. First, very basic, we have to define what does good contrast mean. I think everybody uh, and all of you have a, an image in mind, and of course, if it's, it's bright and nice, then, then you have the impression it's a good image and it's a good diagnostic image quality. And all of you know, and all of you have maybe a uh, pulmonary embolism scan in mind where the image quality wasn't really uh, satisfactory. So I think we all have an, a meaning or an idea what good contrast means. However, I think we should try to really find a definition of the contrast. And um, it's not so easy to find clear and dedicated definitions in the, in the literature. However, there are some, um, some borders or some, some hints defining the good contrast, and, and uh, I will just um, give you an overview about that or just an idea of that. Well, uh, when we would accept a contrast enhancement uh, as to be high enough in CT and geography, well, it should be above um, an absolute value of 300 Hounsfield units, so it should be more than 300 Hounsfield units above uh, the baseline enhancement, then it's a an, uh, it's an good uh, contrast enhancement uh, for the arterial system. However, it shouldn't be uh, too high for different reasons, mainly for, uh, some, uh, for the risk for some striking ad effects. All of you know this, this ad effect uh, to the unenhanced uh, and undiluted contrast, and, uh, contrast material within the superior vena cava leading to striking ad effects. So it's, in such a case, it's difficult to assess the vessel wall around. So the contrast should not be too high. However, there are no clear upper limits as provided in the literature. We all have a meaning it, it shouldn't be that high for uh, imaging reasons and even for safety reasons, and I, I will come to that point later on as well. Uh, the contrast has always to be adapted to the scan time, <clears throat> which was critical in one direction in the past, when the scan times have been very long, but it's also difficult nowadays where we have ultra-fast uh, acquisition times, and I will demonstrate this in, uh, in three slides. So the ultra-fast scanning is really challenging. When you just <clears throat> have, uh, sorry for that. <clears throat> when you just look uh, at the exciting technical progress uh, that the CT machines uh, showed us uh, during the last 10 to 15 years, it's really amazing how the the technical performance of the scanners could be improved. 
this was the scanner where I started my, my residency. I was working on that. Um, it was even before the PAC system time, so we re really um, read the cases from the film. It was a single slice scanner with a rotation time of um, one second. Uh, and the acquisition uh, uh, thickness was usually three millimeters. So for a scan of the entire thoracic otter, it took more than 60 seconds for three millimeter thick slices to, uh, to visualize the entire otter. Nowadays, it's more or less the clinical reality and the clinical routine. We have uh, really ultra-fast scanners providing rotation time of 0 0.3 or even below. So it becomes nowadays possible to image the entire thoracic otter in a really high resolution of 0 0.6 millimeters slice thickness in just two seconds. So that's really amazing. And of course, it's a big advantage in many directions. However, we should really take care to adapt um, our uh, imaging protocol uh, uh, to this dramatically reduced scan time. And uh, we should always avoid to pass the bolus because we are able to scan faster as the blood, and that means even the contrast is flowing through the patient. Just Again, an overview about this uh, exciting technical performance. If you're using really high pitch uh, scan modes, we are uh, even able to, to image the entire thoracic otter or the entire abdominal otter um, in less than one second. And this is really challenging to ensure a really uh, sharp, bright bolus uh, just at that time. So there was a complete paradigm shift um, from the past times of uh, single slice era uh, in setting up our CT protocol. Uh, the spatial resolution was always uh, too low. The acquisition times uh, have been too long. Uh, and the contrast volume that, uh, that we needed in that time was really large with, uh, with uh, severe risks to the patient. And it was always the main challenge to ensure a um, rather good contrast during the very long acquisition time. And sometimes it wasn't possible to, to, um, to achieve a rather good uh, contrast enhancement during these long acquisition times. Nowadays, everything is different, but the main challenge sounds very similar. Of course, we have ultra-fast rotation times, as shown before. We have really high, even isotropic spatial resolution in very, very short acquisition times. Of course, uh, the, uh, the amount of contrast that we need for CT angiography is, is much lower. But the main challenge now is to ensure the good contrast during this very, very short acquisition time. Sounds similar as the previous problem, but uh, it's completely different, but it's still challenging. Since what we really would like to avoid is something uh, like you can see on this image slide here, on this example. Here, the bodus was really passed, so the scan was faster as the, uh, as the blood flow, so rather good enhancement at the aortic arch, but uh, a uh, really insufficient enhancement um, at the very end of the imaging volume, and the reason for that was that the acquisition time was just uh, too high. So uh, in the clinical routine, it's sometimes, uh, it's sometimes really difficult uh, to, to ensure that. Um, what we really need is a very sharply defined uh, contrast enhancement, uh, and we should do our best to avoid uh, to pass the bolus or to scan not uh, really at the peak enhancement. And I will uh, show you what the peak enhancement uh, really means in reality in uh, just a couple of slides. This is another example uh, where uh, everything went wrong. As you can see, we have a very strong, very bright contrast enhancement at the aortic arch. So this is much higher than uh, 300 uh, Hounsville units. Uh, I can also provide you with the uh, direct measurements. So we have an enhancement of 370, so that's, uh, that's quite good. Well, that's a rather acceptable enhancement at the uh, descending aorter, but when we go down uh, below the diaphragm, as you can see, the enhancement is really uh, going down and we have more or less a native examination um, at the level of the iliac arteries. And again, the risk was here. Enough uh, contrast was given to the patient, but uh, the scan was initiated uh, too early and uh, the acquisition time was uh, too short and the bolus was just passed. So a lot of contrast was given to the patient, but it was not, not scanned. Um, this is an example of not scanning at the peak enhancement. So that's, uh, that's the challenge in, in times of uh, 
ultra-fast scanning. So that means we, we still have uh, some pending questions uh, about the definition of a really good countries at CTA. We were not, uh, we didn't talk about the uh, iodine concentration that we really need for that. Uh, we didn't talk to, uh, yet about the um, total amount of, of contrast uh, material that we really need. And uh, we didn't talk about which uh, contrast enhancement uh, we really aim to get. Some of the questions uh, I can try my best to answer during this presentation. Some of these uh, questions are still um, uh, under discussions and there are not, not really accepted answers to that. Of course, our approach, uh, if we have clinical questions, is always to look at the internet, to look at the PubMed and to, to search for, uh, for uh, studies and literature to answer our questions. But uh, as you might know, sometimes it's not that clear, even after uh, looking at the internet and, and reading a lot, uh, a couple of papers, and I will just give you uh, two or three examples of how confusing even the literature search might be, and uh, that, that this is not really helpful. Again, to the question uh, how we can achieve the good contrast, well, you can find a very interesting paper as published in Radiology 2002. Um, um, it was a comparison about the uh, about the different um, uh, contrast agents. Uh, the difference between the contrast agents is uh, among the uh, the content of iodine. And this author, and you can you can read the name of the author here, published in 2002 in Radiology, uh, that um, um, for aortic enhancement, uh, it's better and the enhancement is improved by increasing the iodine concentration of the contrast agents remaining the uh, total iodine load to the patient the same. Really interesting to find is that the same, pa uh, the same author published just uh, two years later in the same, uh, in the same journal and doing uh, very, very similar thing, comparing the enhancements uh, between uh, the author and different contrast agents, he came to the conclusion that the fast injection of an agent with lower concentration would lead to a higher enhancement compared with a slower injection of a higher concentrated agent, ending up again with the same iodine delivery rate, ending up with the same iodine load. So that means the same author in the same journal published in 2002 that the higher concentration is better, but two years later uh, the publication was that maybe the lower concentration seems to be better. So we still don't know uh, about the role of really the iodine content uh, per milliliter of the agent. And um, another just example how funny uh, literature uh, might be sometimes, another paper from 2004 about uh, uh, CT angel for abdominal uh, aneurysms, they came clear to the conclusion that the quantity of 107 ml of contrast is the best, so not 109, not 105, you have to use 107. Well, of course, it's a little bit uh, on the point here, but uh, i just give you an overview or an, an, an feeling about that uh, sometimes even the literature is, is not uh, giving you the final, uh, the final answers. Um, of course, the problem is that uh, especially CT technology is uh, really uh, fantastically, uh, uh, there is a fantastic evolution uh, in the CT technology within just very few years. So it's very, very difficult to publish um, papers or studies really on the point. So if you're ready and finished with your study and if you, if you finished writing of your paper and then it was accepted and then it took another year that it's really published and maybe the next generation of, of CT scan is already on the market and your study is a little bit uh, already outdated. So this is one explanation that sometimes uh, the literature is not uh, really helping us. Well, but uh, I think my my goal of this webinar should not be to show you how difficult liter uh, literature search might be and how difficult uh, it is in reality to find a clear evidence for many, many uh, practical questions. My aim should be to try my best to give you some ideas or, or tips um, how to improve your daily daily practice and how to set up CT angiographic protocol. Of course, I cannot give you the clear answer what is really true. I'm not wiser as all the, the fantastic colleagues uh, which published papers among the, the last uh, 15 years on this topic. I can just try my best to explain you some, some backgrounds and maybe to end up with some very practical and clinical um, recommendations. 
to answer the questions about how much contrast do we really need and uh, how much uh, how high the iodine delivery rate should be and uh, all these other questions maybe it could be helpful to really uh, go a step back um, really back to the basics of the mechanisms of contrast enhancement at CTA and uh, if you look at the basics for contrast enhancement at CTA there are some very very basic uh, principles uh, regarding the physiological and pharmacological principles, about the influence of the different injection parameters, about the role of iodine concentration, content, volume, and delivery. And of course, there is a patient in between, so even the, the circulation plays an important role. So just to, to look very basically to the physiological and pharmacological principles, let's see what happened within the patient when we give a contrast to the patient. And just to simplify that, uh, not using a big bolus, let's start with a just injection of a test bolus, 60 ml of contrast given at a flow rate of 4 ml per second. And uh, the enhancement response in your region of interest will be something like that. So we will have a really fast increase to a peak enhancement and right after uh, arriving to the peak enhancement, there will be a decrease of the enhancement and uh, at the final end you will have some kind of plateau enhancement but on a very, very low level of enhancement. So this is definitely not uh, not uh, sufficient for an uh, contrast enhanced CT angiography. The explanation for this uh, for this course of enhancement within the region of interest is that the uh, the, the first part is um, defined by the first pass. So that's really the arterial pass through of the contrast. And the second uh, phase is the so-called uh, recirculation phase. So since the contrast uh, is an extracellular contrast, it's immediately leaving the arterial system after the first pass. But as soon as the contrast is entering the extracellular space, there is some kind of recirculation into the arterial lumen. And this is defining this second uh, rather low plateau phase enhancement. So that's the very basic uh, um, enhancement response within the patient after giving a contrast to the patient. What happens uh, if we are just uh, increasing the total volume, the total amount of uh, iodine to the patient? Well, the enhancement response is very much similar. It's uh, on a higher level since there is direct relationship between the iodine given to the patient and the enhancement, but the general characterism of uh, the enhancement response remain the same, so we have a fast increase up to the peak enhancement due to the arterial first pass, then we have a decrease, and then we have this plateau phase. So that means uh, within the patient, uh, if we have a rather long acquisition time and a rather long volume, the enhancement response uh, or the enhancement would be something like that, very inhomogeneous, and maybe at the end of the examination, the enhancement within the arterial system will be getting a little bit down. So the answer is an uh, inhomogeneous uh, enhancement. So if you inject more to the patient, uh, the answer is an inhomogeneous um, enhancement. This can be explained by just um, dividing the total bolus given to the patient into a sum of, uh, uh, of a single test bolus, and then we can explain this enhancement response. So we start with the first fraction of the bolus, and then the second, and the third, and the and further on. So that means the enhancement response, sorry, this was too quick. The enhancement response is just some kind of uh, summary effect uh, of the responses here. Everything is moved on a higher plateau, on a higher level of enhancement, but the main characteristics of the enhancement re uh, remain the same. This has been shown by some colleagues. Uh, they used to work in my department uh, 15 years ago, and this showed that uh, if they're really measuring uh, among the uh, examination volume, the uh, contrast enhancement, uh, that the enhancement response is an inhomogeneous one, as we have seen before. What we can do uh, to uh, transform this inhomogeneous enhancement into a more homogeneous enhancement is uh, to um, use a biphasic contrast injection starting uh, with the first third of the total bolus with a higher flow rate and going down for the second two-third of the contrast injection to a, lower, um, to a lower flow rate, we will end up with a summary effect uh, even here, but we will end up in the second phase by a summary of the lower peak enhancement of the second phase and the recirculation of the first phase, and the enhancement response will be a much more homogeneous one uh, as we have seen before. So we are approaching a little bit more the ideal uh, enhancement that we have a very st a stable enhancement on the plateau phase.
This has been shown by uh, my colleagues as well. So uh, if they compared with a biphasic injection, as I demonstrated to you before, and the uh, enhancement response within the patient was this very, very homogeneous enhancement among the entire volume and the entire scan time. So using a biphasic bolus means uh, that uh, we will end up with a more homogeneous uh, enhancement, which is especially true for very long acquisition time. So that means if you would like to um, uh, investigate the entire artery or the, the, um, the lower leg arteries, then the biphasic bolus is highly recommended. So we can uh, already summarize uh, very, very few things. The monophasic bolus uh, is uh, leading to an inhomogeneous enhancement which becomes um, important in case of long acquisition times. The increased volume of iodine will mean that the enhancement is increased, but it's not uh, becoming um, more homogeneous. If we would like to go for a uh, more homogeneous enhancement, we have to use the biphasic bolus. What is the role of the uh, iodine uh, delivery rate uh, or the iodine flux? So that means the role of the amount of iodine given to the patient per second. Uh, it's a very important parameter uh, determining the arterial enhancement. Uh, as I showed you before, the total iodine volume is not that important uh, for CTA for the initial enhancement. The total iodine volume is more important for the parenchymal enhancement and for sure um, to ensure uh, that we are not outrunning the bolus. So it makes you safer, giving a little bit more of contrast as a total volume, then uh, the, the, the risk for passing the bolus is decreased. So these are the main determining factors for the arterial enhancement at um, uh, CT angiography. Of course, uh, we have to think about the contrast application modes, and of course, uh, we have to think about the patient um, uh, within the scanner, uh, and of course, the patient plays a role in that. But let's start with the role of the <clears throat> iodine volume and the iodine delivery rate. Well, there is a very clear and very easy, very straightforward relationship between the iodine and the contrast. As more iodine, as higher the contrast will be. So it's very easy. If you're increasing the iodine, you will have an, end up with a higher contrast. Um, it has been shown in a very <clears throat> and demonstrated in a very, very educational paper as published in the Radiology Clinics of North America 2010 uh, with uh, even phantom measurements as more iodine as higher the enhancement will be, as uh, higher the contrast flow rate will be, uh, as higher the aortic enhancement uh, will be at the final end. So a very straightforward direct relationship is more we give per time, <clears throat> as higher the enhancement will be within the patient. So this can also be demonstrated by this, uh, by this theme of a test bolus. If you are just doubling our uh, iodine delivery rate by uh, doubling the, uh, the flow rate from moving from 4 ml per second to 8 ml per second, that means the iodine flux or the iodine delivery rate is doubled. The enhancement will remain the same from the character, but will just be doubled. So if you give uh, the double amount of contrast per time, the enhancement in your arterial system will be doubled. Uh, well, what we know or what we learned during this uh, 25 minutes right now, the quality of CTA depends on the contrast enhancement. We need a very sharply defined enhancement, especially in ultra-fast uh, CTA. As more iodine, as more contrast. Um, and what uh, I would really like to point out, and uh, I will train with you a little bit, is uh, we cannot uh, decrease uh, our uh, total volume um, uh, given to the patient similar to the acquisition time. You might remember that in the past there was the rule of thumb. You have to inject always as long as you scan. Well, this is not true nowadays in uh, one second uh, acquisitions. If you scan just for one second, to give just 4 ml of, uh, of contrast at a flow rate of 4 ml per second is definitely not enough you will never end up with a sufficient um, uh, contrast enhancement. So this rule of thumb is not applicable for ultrafast scanning anymore. And we should think about uh, how much we can uh, go down with our contrast enhancement in times of ultrafast scanning. And again, don't forget, in many clinical scenarios, again, uh, like in this, um, 
we are not interested in the arterial information alone. So if we have a patient with an acute occlusion of the SMA, of course we are interested even in the parenchymal, um, in the parenchymal contrast. We would really like to see about the intestinal structures in this patient with already an acute um, uh, malperfusion uh, of the intestinal structures. So if we are looking for the arteries in many clinical scenarios, we would like to have some, at least, the parenchymal information. So we need more than just the arterial contrast. And what we would never like to see is an um, example like this. Again, outrunning the bolus. The bolus was too short or initiated too early. Our goal is really to end up with examinations like here. So despite the critical anatomical situation, because sometimes there is really pooling of the contrast within an aortic aneurysm, in this case, we ended up with a very, very bright and very homogeneous contrast enhancement among the entire imaging volume. And that's exactly where we would like to go. Uh, of course, enough contrast was given in, into that patient, so it, uh, the, the examination is five years old, so nowadays we are doing that with a little bit less of contrast, but really important, enough contrast and to wait a little bit after um, the contrast, uh, after the point the contrast reaches the region of interest to give enough time that the contrast is really entering your entire imaging field and you're avoiding to uh, pass the bolus. However, there is for sure an, an uh, upper limit. Um, we have felt, of course, it should be high enough, but it should not be too high. The contrast volume, the contrast volume should not be too high to avoid streaking artifacts, but it should also not be too high uh, to, to keep your patient safe. Uh, we have heard about a very direct and simple relationship between a contrast and iodine, as more, as more iodine, as higher the contrast will be. And we have the very similar, very straightforward, direct relationship between iodine and risk of sin, of contrast-induced nephropathy. So as higher the total amount of contrast we give to the patient, as higher the risk for sin is. There's a direct relationship. And for that reason, we should always find the optimized threshold or the optimized compromise between giving enough contrast to be safe with regards to avoiding passing the bolus and to end up with a good contrast enhancement, but uh, to be as low as possible to, uh, to avoid any harm uh, to the patient. So we have to, uh, to find your, uh, our optimal uh, way of contrast application and the optimal way to adapt our injection to the, uh, to the patient. Patients are different. Um, so the time that the contrast uh, takes from the peripheral venous injection to the arterial region of interest um, is depending uh, from the patient. And we have a really huge uh, interpatient variability on that. So we have a really high interindividual variability and a lot of uh, factors influencing uh, this uh, contrast meter transit time. For example, the cardiac output, the venous excess, so where the injection took place and about the anatomy, is there a venous occlusion on the way uh, to the heart or is there pooling in arterial aneurysms? So we have a lot of influencing factors to the contrast meter transit time. So that means the contrast meter transit time is not predictable. So just seeing the patient from outside, we are not able to estimate uh, how long the contrast will take from the cubital injection to the artery of interest. That's why uh, the so-called fixed delays or best guess technique has been used in times of uh, single slice uh, scanning are not applicable, uh, applicable anymore. They are not acceptable because there would be a too high risk to, uh, to mistiming the bolus or to outrunning the bolus uh, with uh, these fixed delays. So we have to do an adaption uh, to the uh, individual patient either by using a test bolus or what all the machines nowadays is, uh, are offering by using a bolus triggering uh, technique. Uh, this is a very straightforward, very safe technique. And again, it's provided by almost all um, the manufacturers. And by doing a good bolus triggering, you might end up with very bright and very sharp and very homogeneous um, conscious enhancement, even during a long uh, imaging volume. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, what is really recommended and really helpful uh, by using a, a, a bolus triggering sequence is to wait a couple of seconds after the uh, contrast arrival was detected by the bolus triggering. So what we are doing is uh, usually to have an 
uh, eight second uh, delay um, after threshold, so eight second post threshold delay, and this is ending up uh, with uh, really very safe results. So with that, you're really safe and you will never outrun your bolus. And then uh, the calculation of the total amount of uh, contrast or of your contrast injection time is very easy because it's acquisition time plus these eight seconds of uh, post-threshold delay time. And this uh, gives you the total time that you have to inject the contrast to the patient. Of course, it's the appropriate uh, placement of the uh, region of interest for the bolus triggering uh, really crucial. So maybe you have to train your, your stuff depending on the clinical scenarios. There is an old discussion, should we use the ascending order or the descending order? Well, uh, I think there is no clear clue. There are arguments for both. Uh, and uh, the final end, it depends really on the clinical uh, scenario. And you need really uh, very trained stuff uh, to be really aware, even to detect if something is wrong and to, to initiate the scan manually. So of, this is an example of a rather appropriate but even risky uh, placement in the case of aortic dissection, but they were able to place the ROI really in the, in, the, in the true lumen, so the final result was rather good with a good enhancement. Uh, this is another example uh, where it, it wasn't as good, so in that case it would have been better to place the ROI in the ascending auto for sure because the ascending auto is post-operatively here and nicely depicted. So in this uh, case, uh, they place the ROI in the, in the false lumen channel in the, of aortic dissection. So the initia initiation of the scan was uh, too late. You can see you have a bright enhancement here at the false lumen, but you have an insufficient enhancement at the true lumen. And uh, in such a case, maybe you are not happy uh, with the demonstration and visualization of uh, the aortic uh, side branches. Another example here, it was a quite good placement in, uh, in a patient uh, with uh, suspicion for pulmonary embolism. And here everything went wrong. Um, here it seems that these are varices or something like that. So this was mistaken as the aorta, but of course the aorta is here. So if the ROI is uh, not properly placed, then you can do a perfect Use, you can use a perfect CTA protocol, but you will end up with insufficient um, results for sure. So the, the appropriate placement of the ROI and to watch during the, the, the um, monitoring scans is really mandatory to ensure that everything is going in the right direction. Two examples just to show you that uh, in the clinical reality, especially for long acquisitions, uh, it's sometimes really tricky to end up with a good contrast. So different problems, but the result in both cases is that the contrast enhancement is in, uh, insufficient and not satisfactory. Well, here the acquisition was too slow. Here the acquisition was too fast. Here the contrast uh, flow was too fast in this example. And in that example, the contrast flow was too slow. And uh, in the one example, the scan was, start was delayed too late, and the other example, the scan start was too early. So a lot of things that we can do wrong, and seeing that a little bit more positive, a lot of things that we can do good. So now we, uh, we already learned a lot, or heard a lot, as more iodine, as higher the contrast will be. The patient, of course, plays a role, and uh, the role of the patient will be the main topic for the last part of my presentation. Too fast is, of course, uh, fantastic if you have a car, and of course it's uh, fantastic even at CT scanning in, in, some, uh, in some ideas, but it's not always uh, perfect uh, if you are too fast and too much uh, with regard to the total amount of volume is sometimes uh, even dangerous to the patient, and uh, we should keep that in mind when we are setting up our protocols. But still, not everything has been answered. How much contrast we should really give to the patient and how to set up the protocol. And what about radiation? Uh, those answers are not yet answered, uh, especially the radiation will be the main topic for the next, uh, for the second module. But I, I have to provide you with uh, some ideas on that because the radiation, those reduction uh, plays an important role in setting up uh, your CTA protocol nowadays. 
I think I, I was able already to show you that uh, defining the optimized contrast protocol is not so easy just to say, well, uh, just high, because we have learned uh, as higher the iodine, as higher the volume, as higher the contrast will be, uh, or as higher the flow, as higher the, uh, the, the uh, contrast will be, it's not as easy. We have to adapt our protocol to the patient's needs, depending on the clinical scenario and mainly uh, on, the, on the actual situation of the patient. And uh, when we start with the first question, how much contrast you should really give to the patient, of course, we should look at the patient uh, and we should look at the scan parameters. Uh, there are key patient-related factors, including the body size, which is the most important factor, uh, and the cardiac output, which is not as important and usually not as much influencing your protocol. And of course, there are uh, additional uh, less important patient-related factors, including the age, the gender, uh, the venous excess, and uh, the renal and hepatic factors function. But of course, in the clinical uh, routine, it's not possible to uh, to keep an eye on all these factors and setting up a protocol individually, taking into account all these different influencing factors. We should try to, to set up a straightforward uh, and practical uh, protocol uh, for the clinical routine. Very much important, uh, especially in CTA, is the fact that uh, by reducing the KVP settings, the attenuation of iodine is increasing. And since we have learned that the iodine attenuation is of utmost importance for the quality at uh, nowadays CTA protocols, obviously uh, the, the KV uh, settings uh, are an, uh, really uh, influencing factors by Reducing the KV settings, we can either reduce uh, the uh, total amount of uh, iodine given to the patient to end up with the same arterial contrast enhancement, or uh, we can um, we can just um, uh, give the same amount of contrast and ending up with a higher uh, contrast enhancement within the patient. And there are clear relationships again. Um, well, you can. Uh, there is a range at the level of 120 kV that uh, for every milligram uh, uh, per milliliter contrast you give to the patient, the enhancement will be about 25 to 30 Hounsfield units. But if you go down to 80 kV, it will be 40 Hounsfield units. Just to give you an idea um, how much contrast you can save to end up with the same uh, contrast enhancement when you're using low kV protocols. This has been uh, demonstrated nicely even in this uh, in this review article uh, already uh, addressed here. So if you're um, if you're changing the KV settings, but all the other, um, or if you if you uh, uh, change the body weight in, in this example in a patient with uh, the same size, and you give the same contrast injection, the enhancement response will be different uh, within the patient. So as lower the body weight, as higher the contrast will be, remaining the contrast uh, amount uh, uh, stable. And the same is true for the cardiac output. As lower the cardiac output, as higher the contrast will be, but delayed. And maybe you know, especially for a pulmonary embolism scan in a, in a, in a young female patient coming in with a heart rate of 120, uh, it's very difficult to, to catch the bodus because uh, the, 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 the uh, cardiac output is that high that you would really need a high amount of contrast to be safe. So patients are really different. Um, and that's why we have to uh, individualize our uh, injection protocol to take into account the differences uh, of uh, size and shape of the patients. So we have heard about a lot of different influencing factors, and of course the question is how to bring all these uh, things together and where to start uh, setting up your protocol. And um, in the final part, I will just give you some examples how to do that for CT and geography. Well, uh, just uh, to start easy is to start with a so-called normal program. So just take uh, a normal scan that, that you're currently using. Here, for example, a normal patient body mass index of 20. In the past, uh, the standardized protocol was to use the 120 kV scan. And since for the peripheral arteries, long volume, uh, we usually use this biphasic bolus. So this was our standardized protocol, ending up with uh, very, very good results, but uh, as you can see, very, very bright enhancement. So maybe the enhancement was a little bit too much. And uh, of course, thanks to the 120 kV, even the dose length product um, uh, was uh, too much. And again, we have to adapt uh, that to the needs of our patient. And we have to react on the differences of the patient. If we have a patient 
uh, like the small one, there is definitely the risk of too high radiation dose and of too much iodine, really of an iodine overload if we go further with this standardized protocol. In the other guy, of course, there's the risk of low contrast and uh, high background no noise if we don't change anything within our protocol. So again, we have to, we have to react uh, and we have to adapt the volume. We have to adapt uh, or to, to think about the iodine concentration and the iodine delivery rate. And of course, the timing I showed you before is an uh, important factor. What we are doing is, again, uh, to uh, remain things straightforward and simple, we defined uh, four different body mass uh, categories and we are defining our uh, imaging protocol among them. So we start with uh, setting up uh, the allocation of the patient to the body mass index group. So we are simplifying even the, the uh, body mass index groups and definitions from the uh, WHO, from the WHO, uh, into three categories, below 20, 20 to 25, and above a 25 body mass index. Uh, after that step, uh, the patient is directly allocated to a KV setting group, so uh, below 20, it's a 80 kV scan, and above 25, it's 120 kV scan. And after defining, uh, defining uh, these KV settings, uh, we can define our uh, uh, contrast protocol, starting from the, from the uh, standard protocol I showed you before, and then reducing the total amount uh, since we have heard that the attenuation is much higher at lower KV settings. And this will end up with a clear uh, patient-dependent um, uh, acquisition and imaging protocol uh, since we have to inject as long as we scan plus uh, the post-threshold delay. Uh, it's a little bit different for the peripheral CT angiography uh, since the contrast really took a little bit longer to enter uh, the forefoot artery so we can reduce the speed and reduce the uh, injection time. But this would be our standardized uh, biphasic protocol for the peripheral arteries. Again, how to achieve this protocol or how to go there? Again, starting with the normal protocol, the normal program, as I showed you before, 120 kV scan. And then depending on the patient situation, uh, for a thin patient with a body mass index 20, you have to go down to 80. And therefore, you have to reduce the total volume and, of course, the injection flow rate. And then you will end up with a fantastic uh, imaging result bright enhancement, homogeneous enhancement, and a very low radiation dose. And as compared to the example I showed you before, that's just a third of the dose that we have had before. Another example, a body mass index of 20, ADKV protocol, really nice images, no severe uh, background noise, and a rather low radiation dose. Um, and, uh, of course, we have to adapt our protocols uh, to the, uh, to the uh, acquisition time and the total scan time. And uh, by doing that, uh, of course, we can use this approach for all the other anatomical areas within the body as well. So just an example for a scan of uh, the entire author in an obese patient, we will remain with the 120 kV protocol. And in that case, we give 120 ml of, uh, uh, of uh, contrast material with a flow rate of 5 ml per second. And we will end up with a very good, very bright uh, contrast enhancement uh, above 500, very homogeneous. So really a satisfactory result as shown here. Okay, we are uh, reaching almost uh, the end of my presentation. Uh, I will try to summarize uh, the very basics of the contrast enhancement. You have heard it's all about contrast at CT and geography. There's a very direct relationship between the body weight, the iodine load, and the contrast enhancement. As faster and higher the iodine load per kilogram body weight is, as higher the contrast enhancement will be. And as higher the total iodine load, as higher the risk of uh, contrast-induced nephropathy will be. So we have to define our threshold in between. There is an injection time should be adapted to the acquisition time, but it should not be too short. The iodine load should be decreased by using low KV protocols. So this is helping reducing the radiation dose and the iodine dose. And the body mass index is the most relevant practical parameter for selecting the total volume of iodine needed for the individual patient. 
The protocol individualization is required to optimize the risk-benefit uh, relation, and this will be the main topic of the third module of this roadmap. Patient constitution, scan parameters, and contrast injection parameters are closely related to each other, and the protocol individual individualization makes CT uh, a little bit more complex, but I, I hope I did my best uh, to give you some ideas uh, to um, leave it not too complex. So I'm really at the end. Uh, it was It's all about contrast. Just to give you, again, the overview about what will come, less is more, and finally what becomes possible going into clinical practice. I would just like to thank you for uh, attending and listening to me. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Loa. An excellent presentation, and uh, uh, I think you have touched on all the points uh, for which the questions are coming through right up till now. But I'll go through them one by one so we can give a very specific answer to everyone. So the first question is about the strength of iodinate it contrast media. And the question is for peripheral limb and geographies. Uh, mm -hmm. Is it good enough to use 300 milligram per ml for these angiographies? Well, uh, it's a very good question, and uh, it's very, very good, uh, really, to point out the, exactly the the, um, the peripheral arteries. Well, in the, in the past, there had been a discussion, and uh, I showed you some papers ten years ago in the single size area, and there was the belief uh, that the the out and content of the agent is really uh, playing the uh, the most important role. Um, especially if you look for long acquisitions like the peripheral arteries, the the out and content of uh, the agent, so that means how much iodine is within one ml of the contrast, is not the most important factor. Really, the most important factor is how much iodine is given to the patient. And it doesn't make any, any severe difference from the image quality if you're injecting 270 with a higher flow rate as compared to 320 with a slower flow rate, or if you're injecting 400 with a much, much lower flow rate. So uh, to go f uh, with your standardized 320 concentration is, uh, is just good. You have just to adapt your, your um, uh, injection speed to end up with the iodine delivery rate that you would like to end up with. And uh, never be scared about the flow rates. So if, if you have a um, um, uh, rosa uh, venous cannula good in place, you can uh, inject almost all the flows that, that you need, and the patient will yeah, perfectly the tolerate that. The questions you got. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, you very clearly explained it's not the strength, but how you adjust the strength and flow rate and the total content of iodine which is given to the patient. Exactly, right. exactly. Yeah, thank you. Very clear answer. So uh, next question. In fact, we have a couple of questions about the CT venogram. Uh, I think uh, people want to know how we will do for upper and lower limb uh, venograms with the CT. Do you have any advice for them? To be honest, uh, I'm not, not not very experienced in that, uh, and uh, especially for the lower limbs, it's uh, it's uh, still challenging, and uh, I'm definitely not an expert. Uh, what is uh, quite good established, but what is not really a CT venogram is this uh, imaging of the um, uh, of the lower leg veins uh, as part of a pulmonary embolism scan. Well, you are you are good enough to to rule out the major thrombus there, but it's not really a, a dedicated uh, venography. Uh, about really dedicated venography, I'm I'm not the right person. I don't I'm not really experienced on that, so I don't. I can't give you clear uh, clear uh, uh, proposals or recommendations, and uh, yeah, uh, I would oh, prefer you, not you, not to think, just yeah, to yeah. talk around. I'm not a perfect in that. Yeah, I think we'll keep it for later if we have to really answer this question. So thank you very much for for this, uh, Professor Lohr. Now the next question is about uh, uh, streaking artifacts. You showed many pictures about the aortic stents in place. How how we reduce these streaking artifacts in these cases? Well, uh, aortic stents and stent grafts, uh, in my uh, in my experience, never never a problem in that um, because the aorta is such a such a uh, big vessel. So usually the the 
the artifact due to the, the metallic stamped material is not an issue. It's a big issue still. Um, it's still a big issue in, in for coronary stents. And uh -huh. of course, it, it's an issue for, for the lower leg arteries. So if you have a lower leg uh, CT scan in patients with calcifications and stents, sometimes it's really difficult to, uh, to get the view uh, into the stent. What is helpful, of course, is to use a, a dense kernel. Uh, of course, the spatial resolution is, is very much important. So if you have a brand new scanner with very good spatial resolution, this, is, this helps you. Um, the reconstruction uh, helps you and uh, many manufacturers uh, already came out with dedicated uh, software algorithm to reduce the uh, metallic artifacts uh, afterwards. Um, so if you have a scanner providing this, uh, this secondary reconstruction uh, possibility, uh, this is really helpful to get in view inside your stand and, and to avoid this, uh, these streaking artifacts. Okay, no, thank you. Uh, uh, next question is also about aortic aneurysm. They want to know what should be the flow rate uh, in case we are imaging an aortic aneurysm. Well, just as a really very uh, raw uh, rule of thumb, the flow rate uh, should be always around uh, 5 ml per second, very roughly. Again, it depends on the KV settings that you are using. So if if you have an 80 kV uh, set uh, scan, of course, the flow rate uh, can go down, as I've shown you before. Um, and, of course, it's depending a little bit on the on the uh, iodine concentration that you're using. If you're using 270, for example, maybe you have to go up to 6. But just, as a, just for an orientation and as a rule of thumb, the flow rate should be uh, around 5 ml per second for a standard patient. Okay, great. Uh, very clear. Um, so it's 5 ml per second, but they need to adjust it as, as, as in uh, the strength of the contrast media. Now, next question is about maximum density of contrast media and CT angios. Mm -hmm. So uh, how, how they should, uh, can you comment on what should be the maximum density? Yeah, I can comment on that, but, but there are, as I mentioned, there are, uh, you can find a lot of papers in the literature, of course, about uh, talking about uh, what is the lowest acceptable enhancement. But even there are no clear, no clear uh, borders or limits mm -hmm. on that, <clears throat> and you find much less evidence about um, is higher really better. <clears throat> it, sorry, it depends a little bit on the on the anatomical area. Mm -hmm. But that, uh, I would say uh, if it's above 600, then you did something wrong with your uh, contrast protocol. So if you end up with uh, contrast enhancement above 600, uh, then that means uh, that uh, you injected too much contrast to the patient. What is the risk of having too much contrast besides the fact that maybe you have an, out an overload to the patient with increased risk for contrast-induced nephropathy and everything like that? But what is really the risk on your image if, if, you, um, if you have a, a too bright enhancement is that you might miss um, changes at the wall of the vessel. So you might miss non-calcified plaques. You might miss some uh, something going wrong in the in the periarterial tissue uh, because the enhancement might be might be too intense. And so this can too much can uh, reduce the diagnostic image quality. Yeah. So, so no, between three hundred and six uh, between three hundred and six hundred, that's that's a good range. Okay, good. So uh, what, what you are saying is that it can not only damage the kidneys, but you will, may get a very bright image which may not show the details which you really want to see. Exactly. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, uh, the next question, I think you have already touched in your presentation at length and talked about transit time uh, and different yep. factors influencing. Uh, the question is how is the timing to reach the for the contrast media in different areas of whole body after injection, I think they are asking for time for different organs when when the contrast yeah. media yeah. reaches. Well, uh, this is this is uh, practically not not uh, not a high, uh, not highly re relevant issue. It becomes just in uh, in very very single cases and relevant issue if you have an, an aortic interruption like in, in Lerich syndrome and, and you would like to image the, the, the lower, uh, lower leg arteries, uh, then, then it might be an issue. Otherwise, the differences 
or the time that the contrast needs from the ascending artery, for example, down to the abdominal artery, is really in the range of one to two seconds. And uh, if you wait as a recommended uh, six to eight seconds after uh, the threshold enhancement, so it doesn't make a, a, a relevant difference in the clinical routine. So you can discuss if you are feeling safer in the ascending artery or in the descending artery. It's more the question where you feel safer or where your text feels safer, but it's mm. not the main influencing factor um, on your image quality. Even the threshold level, if it's 100 or 150 Hounsfield unit in times of CTA are not that important. If you change from 100 to 150 Hounsfield, this will, this will mean that you change one second. So you will initiate your scan one second later, which at the final end uh, will not influence your image quality. Okay, so thank you. Uh, and now we have almost uh, three, four questions about biophasic enhancement. They they want to know what do you actually mean by biophasic enhancement? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the part, second part of the question is uh, dual injectors. Do we need dual injectors for biophasic enhancement? Well, uh, in general, uh, in, in uh, I would like to answer uh, for the second question first. Uh, in general, for um, for CT and geography, dual injectors are highly recommended because you should really push your contrast out by, by giving a saline bolus afterwards. So I would say you need the, the uh, double injectors, not, not for the biphasic injection, but for the injection to give as a first phase contrast and the second phase uh, uh, saline. What I meant, and maybe this was my fault not to be clear enough, with a biphasic, I, I'm not calling the saline the second phase. Uh, so with biphasic, I mean uh, to uh, subdivide the uh, iodine injection into two phases of different injection speed. And if you like, like so, then then I'm I'm um, in favor for a, th a three-phasic uh, injection. So two phases of uh, iodine and one uh, and the, the last phase is is saline. So we need a, a double injector even for that. What is the uh, idea behind this biphasic iodine injection? I showed you before. If you have a long scan range, you can at the final end save contrast because if you have a long acquisition like the peripheral arteries, you are not required to inject for 20 or 30 seconds with a flow rate of 4. This would mean you would end up with 120 ml of contrast because we know that the, the, the last amount of contrast you give to the patient will never enter uh, your artery of interest while you are scanning. So it, it would be wasted contrast. And we know that, especially for the peripherals, the, the blood flow is slower. So that's mm -hmm. why uh, it has been proven that, especially for the peripherals, it, it's very good to reduce uh, the, uh, the injection speed for the second part of your injection. Um, and that's what we are calling the biphasic injection. So this was so, meant yeah, for biphasic. You. It's a very clear answer. So the contrast media is divided into two boluses. The second is slightly yep. slower and then followed by a saline injection. Okay, exactly. thank you. Now, next question is about bolus tracking, and they want to know if we are doing an ECG-gated aortic angio, how, what should be the Hansfield uh, value for a bolus tracking? Uh, you know, the, same the, is the true. Strength, of, strength yeah. of signal from, uh, from a bolus uh, for tracking, what yeah. should be the HU value for that? The same is true. Uh, the ECG gating has no influence on that. Uh, you have just to check what scanner are you using. There are scanner using the, the absolute values uh, of Hansfield for the bolus triggering, and there are other scanners using the, the Hansfield units above uh, the native enhancement. So that's the only thing that you should take into account. And the thresholds should be somewhere between 100 and 150. It doesn't make a difference in the ECG gating, as I mentioned before. Um, in general, if you if you set up a, a good protocol for a contrast injection. A CT angio is a very stable examination, very robust, and one second plus or minus should not play a role. Okay, so uh, they, they, they need to check what, what equipment they are using and see what yep. the trigger they have set in the protocol. Yep. Yeah. Great, thank you. Now, there are a couple of questions about uh, renal failure patients, and sometimes they are asked to mm -hmm. do and uh, a pulmonary NGO or other angiographies, uh, mm -hmm. do they need contrast for that? 
Well, if you're doing an angiography at CT, you always need contrast. Um, mm-hmm. And um, you have to define as first step, uh, is, is the patient really in need for the examination? And if the answer is yes, then sh- you should go for the examination. Mm-hmm. And, uh, of course, you should be very careful uh, in setting up your protocol. But my approach is, or my opinion is, you should end up with a good examination. So it doesn't make sense to do a pulmonary embolism scan with 20 ml of contrast because you are that you are that afraid of, uh, about the risk of uh, contrast-induced nephropathy. You will end up with an insufficient scan, so you would not be able to rule out the pulmonary embolism, but you still have given 20 ml of contrast to the patient and some radiation. So if you say mm-hmm. yes to the examination, then you should do the examinations as good as you can, of course, with the lowest amount of contrast possible, but with some uh, limits. The main goal should be to end up with a diagnostic uh, examination. After the first step, which was, do we really need this examination? If the answer is yes, then it should be a diagnostic examination. Okay, great. No, thank you. Uh, I've got another question, which is, uh, in fact, a couple of questions about BMI. Uh, the first question is, uh, is uh, I'm paraphrasing the question here, uh, is uh, body surface area more relevant uh, than BMI? Yeah, uh, if, if you would like to make it uh, even more accurately than the, the body surface uh, uh, marker is, uh, is even more accurate, a little bit more complex to calculate. Uh, body mass index is very easy to, to be calculated, and um, my approach is to, to, to find, an, again, some kind of threshold between being accurate and personalized, but keep, uh, keep things still practical and, and, and robust and safe. My experience is as, as more as we calculate, uh, the higher the risk for some, some errors might be. Body mass mm-hmm. index is very, very simple. And with some routine, I think you can you see the patient and you can you can assign the patient to a body mass index group, uh, and you will be uh, uh, accurate in most of the cases. Of course, you will calculate it. It's very easy, straightforward, and uh, it has been shown that there is quite good evidence that the body mass index is good enough as an indicator. More accurate yeah, okay. would be body surface area, but but it works out with body mass index as well. So the message is keep it simple, but I have another question on yep. the same line. They, they're saying uh, for cardiac uh, uh, CCTA or some uh, cardiac imaging, do they also need to consider the diameter of the thorax at the base of the heart? Is is this correct that we need to do, consider that? I'm not doing that uh, in, a, in, a, in a clear fashion, but of course, you know, um, uh, I propose the different body mass indexes and, and, and the influence on the on the KV settings uh, they should have. Um, and for the middle group, um, uh, it was written 100 to 120 KV, and that's exactly um, the situation. So when we got the feeling that uh, the diameter at the, at the base of the heart is, is high, then we are going even in the middle BMI group for a 100, 120 protocol, because especially at the baseline, uh, uh, basis of the heart, um, uh, background noise uh, could be really deteriorating the, the image quality. So we are not definitely measuring by really measuring, but, but we are assessing visually. And if we got the impression, well, there's a huge diameter, then we are going for 120, even in the middle group. Yeah. So it's not a very hard and fast rule. You, you make an assessment by visual and uh, yep. adjust for that. Great. No, thank you. Very clear answer once more. Uh, now coming to uh, about the dual energy CT, I think they mean, uh, do you recommend a dual energy for reducing contrast volume and radiation dose? Um, well, I'm working uh, since years with the dual energy scanners, um, <clears throat> uh, scanner, and I have to tell you beside the, of the pulmonary arteries uh, where the question is about some kind of iron map and, and, and this stuff, we are never using the dual energy uh, technology for, for the vascular studies. We are using um, the scanner and the dual source technique to uh, increase the acquisition speed, which is important, especially for the, for the heart. But short answer, uh, we don't use the dual energy. 
technique for, for vascular studies. Yeah, okay, uh, thank you. And uh, the next question is about uh, imaging hemangiomas. Uh, are there any particular adjustments you would advise uh, which are necessary to image hemangiomas? Hemangioma? Hmm. Well, uh, I guess the question is more in, in, in regarding uh, AV malformations or vascular malformations, and of course we have to differentiate if, if we're talking about the intracranial one or, or peripheral ones. Um, I have to tell you, we are we have a huge service for the AV malformations, and and we are basically doing that with time-resolved MR angiography, and in very very rare cases we are doing that uh, at CT angiography. Uh, what we are doing that, and we are doing that in in some other indications as well, is setting up at some kind of time-resolved scan, so repetition. Uh, of the scan and uh, for that to to keep the radiation dose at an acceptable level uh, we are really uh, using low kv protocols with really low mi settings so the images are not beautiful but since the main information is the uh, the contrast information the contrast, uh, contrast information is always there even if there is uh, increased background noise and this can be quite helpful to have such a even the the 4D information about the about the inflow and outflow uh, within uh, malformations. Uh, with regard to the contrast, uh, we are not doing uh, a severe adaptation to the protocol. It's a CT angiography. The difference is that that we are increasing the uh, the the phases that we are acquiring. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, and next question is about optimal IV access. They are talking about with reference to PE scanning. Uh, if they have a poor IV access, uh, do you recommend any adjustments which can help if they have a poor IV access? Well, basically, uh, in most of the patients, it's possible to, to, to get a an, an good venous access. Um, of course, sometimes it's time-consuming. Um, sometimes it's recommended to do it even ultrasound-guided. I know this is uh, not everybody is able to do that. Uh, and if you are in a private center, of course, you're not able to do that. And, and of course, it's time-consuming. Um, second, uh, what I recently found out, um, and uh, I don't have any, any financial uh, relationship to that, but there is a huge company providing, uh, providing material for the hospital and health uh, care products. They uh, brought up a an, um, an very interesting venous cannula with uh, side holes, and uh, uh, they have a 2020 gauge needle, which is the, the very small blue one, and it's possible to inject uh, 6.5 ml per second uh, uh, through such a cannula. So it's really amazing to have such a thin cannula providing such a high flow. And uh, you are almost in every patient able to put such a very small cannula uh, into the patient. So it's a rather new product. Of course, it's expensive, so it's not recommended as the standard cannula. But it could be a really very good um, uh, bailout strategy in, in the severe, you know, in the oncologic patients or very sick patients in need for a pulmonary embolism scan. It would be much better to really invest your time by optimizing the venous access as to reduce uh, the amount of uh, out and delivery rate. But we have to differentiate. If you have an oncologic patient, um, usually you can really go down to 80, or if your scanner is uh, able to do down to 70 kV, and then the result might be good even with a flow rate of 2.5. If the problem mm -hmm. of the veins is more uh, because the patient is very obese, then, of course, um, before you do a P scan with a flow rate of 2, it's better not to do the scan because you will not be able uh, to rule out the segmental pulmonary embolism. But I really um, found this, this new cannula as a very good bailout in, uh, for, this, uh, for these patients. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, no, thank you. A related question is, if they have a uh, central line in place, can they use yep. that? Yeah, okay, so great, simple answer. <laughs> so we have a couple of questions about different procedures now about how to reduce artifacts. The first one is how to avoid subclavian vein artifact in carotid angios. What will be the flow rate and scan time for a normal patient? Well, there, there, I think that's, that's a very, very good 
question and it's really a challenging problem and there is no no easy answer to that and no clear answer to that um First of all, of course, it's it's better to use uh, the the uh, access from the right side, except patients where the question is really dedicated to the to the right subclavian artery or to the right common carotid artery. Second is to really invest a, a lot of time to really optimize your uh, contrast administration. So one way, of course, is uh, to use a double injector and to really uh, to really push out the contrast by giving saline afterwards and to reduce your uh, total volume of contrast. So this would mean mm. that you reduce the, the, the time of your injection and you reduce the risk that there is still too much contrast uh, within the right subclavian uh, vein. However, in a patient with uh, a uh, high cardiac output, especially in younger patient, then there is really the high risk that you're passing the bolus. If you have an, mm. an elderly patient, with a, a slower cardiac output, then you can really reduce the total volume of contrast down to 50 or even 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 below, uh, using a saline uh, saline chaser afterwards, and then then usually you can avoid this uh, this ad effects due to the overlaying uh, venous structures. So push it with saline so that it clears the subclavian artery. Yeah. So a similar question is about reducing the artifact from superior vena cava in pulmonary and juice and aerotogram. So are there similar principles? Pardon me? Sorry. Pardon me? So a, a very similar question is reducing the artifact for SVC in yeah. pulmonary and juice and aerotograms. So it's the same. It's the same, same. basically. But again, yeah. they're really tricky, especially the PE patients. They have tachycardia, so they have a really increased cardiac output. We all know mm -hmm. that, especially in young patients the enhancement might be insufficient. So if you if you reduce your contrast volume, there's a high risk that you're passing your bolus. So in such a situation, I would prefer to have streaking artifacts in the superior vena cava, but a good enhancement in the uh, pulmonary arteries. So again, a so related question would question not reduce the volume. Yeah, how much saline should be uh, used after pushing a contrast? And should we give saline before we give the contrast media? Well, the saline before is is helpful just to check uh, the line and the quality of the line, but it's not it's not okay. necessary to give saline beforehand. Afterwards, usually we are giving in 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 grown ups um, with uh, no severe cardiac problems. We are go giving 40 ml of saline uh, with the same uh, injection speed as the second phase of the contrast injection. Okay, great. Now, next question is: What is your recommendation on performing a triple rule out angiography? My recommendation is not to do that, <laughs> and okay. uh, that's uh, that's also the recommendation in the guidelines. It's still not a recommended examination. Uh, my experience is it's better to to focus either on the pulmonary arteries or on the coronaries. If you like to have both, uh, it can be really tricky and difficult, especially in the emergency situation. Okay. Uh, we are almost there, so this is the last question. Is there any role of contrast in identifying instant thrombosis? Everything what has been said during the last uh, 80 minutes or so uh, is true even for, for the instant, uh, instant thrombosis. Um, as I mentioned, a smaller the diameter of the stent, the more difficult this might be, so you really need a high spatial resolution of your scanner. You should take advantage of all a reconstruction algorithm your, the modern scanners are providing. But still, if you have uh, stents with a small diameter, it's sometimes really difficult to differentiate between artifact and really instant thrombosis or instant restenosis. But there is nothing you can improve just by, by improving your contrast administration. You need an optimal contrast administration as for all the CT angiographic protocols, but nothing special you can do with the contrast in such a scenario. Um, thank you very much, Professor Loire, for an excellent presentation and then going through all the questions in such a detail and very clear answers. So thank you very much uh, for your presentation today. Uh, before we close the call, I would really like to remind everyone that there is a short survey after this uh, uh, session, so please do fill in. It will take less than 30 seconds, I I'm, I'm told. So uh, with this, I would like to thank 
all the participants and uh, thank you very much for your time and once again thank you very much professor lower and we will, this we will close the call thank you take care have a good day bye thank you bye bye